Welcome to uh, the Just Economy Conference 2021 um, with the National um, Community Reinvestment Coalition. Happy to have you all here at this workshop, a recording in Boston. So um, nice documentary that you all should see, if you haven't seen it, highly recommended. So uh, I have with me today, James Rutenbeck and Kathy Dixon. So welcome uh, to the uh, Just Economy Conference. Happy to have you here today. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Juan. Thank you for having us. Yeah, so we're going to have, um, I have a couple of, I mean, more than a couple of questions. We're going to try to sort of have a dialogue and conversation today. And, and, uh, and I wanted to sort of like, um, I wanted to start by asking each of you, if you can tell us more about yourself, uh, and and yeah, who I mean, tell us more about yourself so that people can get to know you a little bit more. Sure. Coffee, do you want to start? No. Okay. Um, I'm I'm from a small uh, working class farm town in eastern Iowa, uh, where I grew up. I went to college in the Midwest, and then after college, I worked in um, rural rural West Virginia on a teacher corps project. And because I had thought that I wanted to work with young kids as a teacher, but then I realized I was temperamentally unsuited to that work. And I always loved film and theater, and I just decided to go for it. So I moved to the East Coast. I worked in New York for a small educational film company. I moved to Boston because I had heard that there was a longstanding tradition of nonfiction filmmaking here, and I wanted to be part of that. And so I was a waiter for many years while I worked on film projects, mostly uh, for no salary, and got to know people in the community, went to grad school here, and I've stayed on. And so I've been working as a director and editor um, for since the early 1980s when I finished grad school. And I've worked on films that are I worked for a company in Boston called Vital Pictures that did a series called Unnatural Causes, uh, which was about health disparities. Um, the subtitle is, is inequality making us sick? And I've worked on some other films about race and um, social justice issues. And, um, but A Reckoning in Boston is a film that unexpectedly sort of took me to a new involvement with social justice issues. Kathy, you wanna tell us all yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Kathy Dixon. I am uh, a native Northeasterner. Um, I'm also a native Bostonian. Um, we can trace our lineage back in New England and in Boston, uh, at least six generations. Um, I'm also a business owner uh, and well before I even knew what the concept was or the statement of social impact at the age of 19 I opened up my first business, which was a social impact business now that I know. Um, where I was helping women access furniture bedding specifically. Um, after there was a rash of neglect reports opened up against single mothers, low income single mothers, um, for things as simple as not having adequate bedding, the children sleeping in the same beds um, and not having uh, bunk beds, so on and so forth. Um, I've had many businesses throughout my life. Some I've sold, some I've moved on from um, and just decided to at this point in my life that uh, with the background in farming and agriculture, uh, I had an interest in uh, going into rural farming. Um, the famous story is that in my transition to Vermont, right, or to uh, the mountains of the Berkshires here in Massachusetts, that I realized that um, I had a privilege and my ability to be able to transition to rural land that even though I didn't have an education to speak of, and um, you know, I had challenges in my life a lot around race, class, and gender, that being able to have a dream of um, transitioning from what I considered a violent space to a peaceful space was a privilege within itself. Um, before transitioning out of the city of Boston, I decided to um, 
see if I could assist some of the women that I considered my friends who were in the communities, in the urban communities, living in poverty, suffering from lower resources, challenged, again, by issues of class, power, and privilege, and to see if I could bring some of my understanding of what co cooperative knowledge was um, and cooperative works uh, and intersect it with uh, food systems work to um, provide them ways to come together as a community center and be healthy. Um, from that uh, intention, Common Good Cooperatives was born. Uh, Common Good Cooperative, Quiet is Kept, um, has 900 members sitting on a meetup. Uh, we have about 60 members uh, who have registered through our new website. And we're running a crowdfunding campaign through iFundWomen, where we've had at least 35 members um, come on and crowdsource the sustainability of the co-op. Uh, the future of the co-op is to be a zero waste co-op in an urban environment where we talk about uh, community health wellness and neighborhood development specifically from the voices of the people who embody the community who have been here gen generationally um, with a focus on reciprocity and reconciliation in the community and that reciprocity and reconciliation is um, their generational ties to Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan, as people of color, and um, with an acknowledgement that they're being displaced and moved out, and hoping that uh, our organization could act as a gap stop and a way to provide them um, foundation, some sustainability, some way to push back against um systems that are going on now in the city and our country which are creating challenges to um, the basic existence of black families here in the city thank you thank you so i'm going to get back to the cooperative question that you're talking about because i am very passionate about cooperatives so i'll i'll, I'll, I'll come back to that um, but I wanted to ask Steve, I mean what motivated you to sort of like um make this uh, documentary I mean, what is sort of like your personal motivation to to be to have done this? Uh, yeah, well, I I had been to I make I've made other documentaries over the years that are um, mostly like passion projects, I guess, the films that are generally underfunded, but they're about things I care about. Um, and oftentimes these films are longitudinal and they take time to make because part of the filmmaking is documenting people's lives as they're changing over time so sort of finding people who are really interesting and watching their lives unfold and in this case it took um, five years to make this film and it started i guess when i went to uh, a benefit dinner for mass humanities which has a program called the clemente course in the humanities which is a tuition free night course in the humanities art literature philosophy and history for people who never had the opportunity to go to college for one reason or another and there are 34 sites across the us of clemente courses um, i heard a graduate speak at this dinner and was really impressed by this woman and she would she was able to take the six credits that she got from bard college which everyone who completes the course will get and sort of launched herself into an undergraduate career and was able to had a really inspiring story about graduating from college and becoming a you know pursuing work that was meaningful to her and sort of releasing this potential that she always had in her but was never allowed to find fruition and so i thought that seemed like a really um you know I was thinking like within each of the classrooms, like in Dorchester, the Dorchester site in Mass, there's several sites in Massachusetts, but there's one in Dorchester where coffee studied. Um, I, you know, within this one class of 22 people, I, I assume, my God, there must be like such amazing stories from the people in the classroom. And so I had just enough money in 2014 to to know that we could film the classes over the course of a year, not all the classes, but like eight classes with multi cameras in a black box space at the Codman Square Health Center. And that I trusted that from there, you know, we could do more filming over time, but I didn't really expect 
I thought that we would film a little bit outside the classroom with some of the some of the people and the, some of the students. And that was where things got more complicated. As I got closer to two of the students, Coffey and uh, Carl Chandler, um, who were both, you know, really outstanding students in the course. But as I got to, as I spent more time with them and saw the obstacles in their lives as people of color in Boston, in a, a city that was changing dramatically and booming in many ways, but not for people on the lower tiers of, of Boston, you know, the city. Um, the film, <clears throat> the film changed um, pretty dramatically. And so it was a film starting out as a film about transformation through experience engagement with art and literature and philosophy, which it still is in some ways, but there's a, there's a, another piece to the film now and another narrative that explores systemic racism and primarily through, through um, Coffee and Carl's stories. And, and I have to say that I was very impressed by some of the, uh, the reflections and conversations that, that the students like Kathy had, like going through those, like, uh, those philosophical conversations. So I was like, I was very impressed by that. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give back to you in a minute, Kathy, but I wanted to sort of have a follow up with James, because also I saw that um, as you were telling the story, stories, uh, of the students and the city of Boston. Also, this also, this film also was sort of impacting you personally. Uh -huh. uh, if you can say more about that, because it seemed to me that you you kind of you you were going through your own personal sort of like a, um, reflection transformation to this process. If you can say more about that, right? Well, what happened was I, I started to recognize that. Um, I didn't really understand everything that was going on, especially in Coffee's life. And uh, as someone who was aspiring to do something that seemed very noble to me and something that I think anyone in a conservative or a, a progressive person would say is admirable, like organizing in your neighborhood, uh, raising food for your neighbors, doing it in a cooperative way. It seemed to me like, wow, this, this is the kind of thing that everybody talks about. You know, this is what, uh, this is sort of an ideal situation. Um, but there were so many obstacles that coffee was facing along the way. And Carl as well, like both of them were faced with eviction. Coffee was evicted during the course of the film. Um, I started seeing other, <clears throat> meeting other people from the course who had housing insecurity issues, food insecurity issues. Um, I learned some of the members of the Clemente course, some of the students had been bused to South Boston and Charlestown in the 70s, 1974. Um, and I just started to see that like, I'm in, I realized I was in over my head in terms of my understanding of these stories. And that I started to see that I was arrogant uh, to even think that I could mediate these stories um, because I just didn't have the wherewithal to do it or the life experience. And so I um, enlisted Coffee and Carl as producers to work with me in a collaborative way to help me um, try to <clears throat> tell the story and make sense of it. And then what happened was we met with an executive from uh, PBS from, Indep from Independent Lens, the PBS series, who was interested in the film, but felt that, you know, I had sort of dipped my toe into being uh, a wit, more than a witness, like someone who was actually a minor character in the film, who was sort of commenting on what I had seen. And this executive said, James, unless you really bring yourself into the film in a deeper way, the way Coffee and Carl have, this film is just going to be like every other film of its kind. And so Coffee basically became executive producer and started um, organizing these sessions where I would meet with her and Carl and Tolga Shields, who's in the film, and Coffee's friend Fernando, who teaches at Tufts Medical School. We would meet at his office in Charlestown and look at basically the challenge was for me to bring my voice into the film um, and to be a witness. 
and part of to be more than a witness like to enter in and sort of be transparent about my difficulty and my missteps in making trying to make this film and being guided and supported by people of color who were who valued my voice and who were saying to me james you know when you went to housing court with coffee and you saw how chaotic it was and you saw all these families that were there who were facing eviction with no legal support you know and how did that make you feel you know and how did it make you feel when you um when coffee was evicted and or when you went to the housing office with coffee and so there was a group of people around me supporting me to bring my voice in not to become a character in the film but to tell the help give a sharper relief to coffee and carl's stories and also just to be more transparent about how the film was being made and who was making the film and um i sort of you know i think what happened was i became friends with coffee and carl and when bad things happen to your friends you try to support them right and so i couldn't just be an observer anymore i had to like enter into the film in a more overt way and stick up for these people that i'd come to know and, and um care for and i think that was that was when the film really changed. And the film had been sort of floundering, like it wasn't coming together as a film um, before that. And I think it bringing my voice in allowed me to do a lot of basic film things to like storytelling things that broke. We were able to sort of disrupt chronology and be a little freer about how we told the story and I was able to bring say things in a, a very concise way that would propel the story forward like details that you know could have taken a long time to unfold in a long scene or something um I could just sort of expedite some of the storytelling too so it just ended up working really well and Nolan Walker who was the executive from ITVS um we sent him the film after we worked on it together and he really liked it and wanted me to do some more work and I worked closely with him. And then PBS, Independent Lens, uh, picked up the film, licensed the film for broadcast. So it will be on Independent Lens next year. Great. Um, Daffy, I was thinking uh, what it was striking for me to see you sort of like somebody who was very resilient that would never would be give up, always sort of like ready to sort of fight back, no matter what. And um, so one, I was well, I was going to ask you sort of, how did, how did it feel to be a co-producer and being in the film for these five years? Uh, so one question, and then two, I wanted to ask you more about your own uh, involvement in organizing also in Boston. So you can first sort of like share more your, your feelings about being in the film for like, five years and, and, and how do you feel? Yeah. Um, the, you know, opening up, we talk about vulnerability a lot in terms of making this documentary. We talk about, um, you know, on a basic level, the vulnerability of myself, Carl and James, but on a higher level, you're talking about the vulnerability, the shared vulnerability of a white man, right? the shared vulnerability of a black woman, right? And the shared vulnerability of an interracial uh, man of color uh, with a background in, in indigenous and Native American community. Um, and a lot of people ask me what brought me to that point of um, vulnerability, what brought me to the point of committing to being vulnerable and uh, in the documentary, to participating it, to opening up my world to James, to opening up my world to Carl, and to open up my world to what I had always seen as a violent space for so many uh, lower class, lower resource women here in the city of Boston. But you know, to opening up my world to be critiqued by so many, right here in the city, who maybe 
uh, did not resonate with my experiences or were in disbelief of the experiences of so many uh, women and men here in the city of Boston around uh, displacement. But um, I began to realize really what was a violent space was the cooperative development. What was a violent space was um, first, you know, asking for autonomy in the voice of Black women and in our experiences, and then advocacy for that, right? And then what is it to be seen as a disgruntled, angry Black woman as I demand, you know, uh, to hear our experiences and to hear our suffering um, in these spaces and places that were uh, that we were being told were no longer for us. Um, I didn't think I would survive the process of talking about this work um, with common good cooperatives or advocating for these women who were marginalized and very unseen, who are always just names or data or research or statistics in a university or in organizations, but hadn't actualized not just within themselves, but within those spaces where they, people were supposed to be act, um, advocating for them. So um, I said, if you want to know my world, James, because people need to know our world, then yes. Um, and in supporting James for what he was witnessing, realizing that he was witnessing violence, what was commonplace to us, I was witnessing it taking a toll on James and I was witnessing him wrestling with the experiences of ours, the difficult subjects that most people prefer not to even approach. He's standing there by me in Dudley Station in the welfare office in the homelessness unit. Not because I was there for myself, but in watching what happens to women and men as they be get into cabs and become their own domestic migrants to the other side of Massachusetts to communities that are not their home, you know, just to stabilize themselves. I'm witnessing him wrestling about why he's at housing court with me or why he's at the Section 8 office, what his power meant and advocacy for me in those spaces. And why did I feel that he could be, that he was important in those spaces? wrestling what it meant to be a white man of power in those spaces and for him to provide transparency to the very real issues that black women have, um, that women have in the city, right? So um, I wanted to be gentle and create a space for him, those same space I would ask for myself or the women, a space where we could be heard and decompress and feel supported. And Dr. Fernando Una from Tufts came through and in reciprocity and realizing, and I guess James and his self-realization of needing help telling, not even help, wanting us to be able to have voice in the story. The power of telling somebody to have voice in their own story provided Carl and I an opportunity to be producers. Did the two of you, this question came up now as you were talking, um, got along fine or a situation where you say, James, you're totally out of place here. What are you talking about? Everything worked out fine. It was like, how, how, how did this, I mean, what tensions, conflicts, how did this sort of like relationship? Yeah. I mean, you know, because it's five years, five years is a long time. So like trying to sort of understand one place, understand each other, understand the issues. Yeah. Well, can I speak to that, James? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. There may have been people circling and orbiting me who did not understand, um, who weren't clear on what James was doing or what I was doing with James, like <laughs> the, the the odd couple, right? Uh, in our friendship. Yes, I can see how 
people believe that in working across race and class, there are conflicts. I can also see how people perceive that those conflicts specifically lie with women of color and their ability to integrate into the understandings of other people's culture, right? While they're advocating for themselves or their experiences again, or their community. But the thing that made James different than a lot of people is that a lot of people that black women would push back on, right? The, 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 the concept of hero, right? James did not come in, he came in behind a camera and shied away from making himself the, 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 the lead in these stories of our lives. It just so happened that his story was integral to ours and intersected ours in very a very powerful way. But there were very few conflicts in five years to be had between James and I because he came in to listen and to he came in to witness. He did not come in in judgment or critique. Um, he came in understanding that we had a story to be told and he wanted to know what that story was. And even more awesome, he could have just told the story, documented it, and then left, right? And invited Carl and I to watch the documentary of our lives, watch the development around our lives. He could have been on these panels solely, but in the true form of altruism, I think I'm pronouncing that right, <laughs> in the true form of giving, right? In a true form of community and friendship, he took what power that he would have had as a director with such a powerful film and seeded that power into Carl and I and an understanding that again, we had the ability, capacity and competency to speak to our experiences and to speak to an audience so that they fully understand what they were witnessing in the documentary and made it equitable. Let's not forget about that. <clears throat> but that's great. I, I wanted to shift gears a little bit and, 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 and I had to say there are many things that uh, relate to me in terms of like, um, I've been in Boston for 30 years. So some of the situation like um, I, 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 I did work with you that went to Thompson Island and so there are scenes like that that were like uh, mm -hmm. were very touching and like seeing you and, and they were very, yeah. very nice scenes. Okay. But, but I wanted to sort of like talk about, I mean, pretty much sort of bringing, bringing us back to the issue of like um, in some way race equity and the issue of gentrification in mm -hmm. the city of Boston. Uh, I, 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 I think in some ways, uh, and your work uh, has been sort of like trying to sort of like, um, not just speak up, but also like be an example of somebody who's sort of like uh, organizing. And and uh, and by the way, I also I did work for City Life with Urbana, so I was very pleased to see you there, uh, standing up and 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 doing that protest. So mm -hmm. if you can if you can talk more about like I wanted to sort of like uh, uh, you tell me more about how how you see like like Boston where things are at right now. I know this a long history of like neighborhood segregation, school segregation, and um, issue when the integration happens, and, and uh, many things that are still lingering in, in many different levels and now uh, being gentrified. If you have any reflections that you'd like to share and, and at the light of your own activism and organizing. Yeah, um, Boston is a fascinating city. Um, and again, being generational to Boston, I, I, I want to think about the displacement of my family uh, generations and generations ago from Beacon Hill, right? As uh, African American Northerners, uh, as working class, as domestic labor, and how they were pushed out of Beacon Hill and um, ended up in Newton, Newton, Massachusetts and how they sought a place to be able to uh, build community and worship on their own and um, founded Myrtle Baptist Church and Newton Center. 
um, the matriarchs of our line and how, um, thank you to my paternal relationship um, with uh, my family from Newton. Um, I think oftentimes in development, we miss where it stands on the neck, shoulders and bodies of the people who existed in that city. One of the conversations I really hear spoken about, we are always talking about how to make room in the city for uh, so many, but um, we don't talk about what community was lost. The advocacy for the women, specifically around people of color, specifically around African American communities um, in Boston in face of gentrification, was we knew the city was being gentrified a long time ago. We knew there was no space for African American communities. And that's brought forth by just looking. I encourage anybody to look at the statistics um, for. The, the diminished uh, nature numbers of African-American families here in the city of Boston. Um, I realized that nobody talked about that, right? Nobody talked about how few African-American families there existed in the city, um, how we were replaced, right? And in, in the truest way of a colonized country in the truest ways of politics, right? In the truest way of pitting communities against each other, um, you know, uh, we were slowly but surely replaced, right? By other communities without a question or a blink of an eye on what happened to all the African-American businesses. African-American hair salons. What happened to the African-American social halls, clubs, restaurants. What happened to the African-American community in its culture that once existed and thrived all through South End, all through Roxbury, all through Dorchester, right? What happened to that community? It's not talked about that there are no longer African American social gathering places that they've been closed down or unsupported and lost, right? So the gentrification is not doesn't just start by raised rents or um, raised rents or illy, ill, uh, ill uh, used policy, right? or illly de disseminated policy, um, the, 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 the red flag that there was no longer space was at, for us was um, the diminished support around economic development to stay stabilized. And, I, 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 and to talk about gentrification in Boston, it was first gutting African-American communities of their ability to participate in economic development and business development that led to our inability to stabilize within the city, that led to us being a vulnerable community that is now scattered throughout the state. And some will say New Hampshire and Rhode Island as well. One other thing that I that I um, wanted to share with you is sort of like the fact that, I mean, talking about gentrification is the fact that there are places that change their names. They were like Roxbury, they changed their name and zip codes to sort of disassociate themselves from Roxbury because it was the, where the black people live, right? Like let's say Mission Hill. Mm -hmm. That was part of like, they changed the name yet to sort of like market themselves differently. And maybe this is another like documentary at some point, James. It's also like all these like clubs owned by black people in Dudley and also like in the, um, uh, in the South End that also was part of Rockbury that totally was transformed over the past 40 years. So there was a lot of sort of like it was a thriving black community with like jazz and businesses at some yeah. point. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that is part of the history. Yeah. Um, and, 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 uh, and, and the thing that I was thinking, uh, going back to you, Kathy, because you mentioned cooperatives and others, and when you went, and, and I'm not going to get stuck with the city because also there are policies that can solve things, yeah. and how frustrated that probably was for you going to talk to the city. And and uh, um, what 
how, how do you see the solutions in the model, like thinking about like from a community perspective? I mean, when it comes down to sort of like we could do X, Y, and C. I mean, if you can, if you can, if you have any reflections in the model, like tackling these problems and yeah. driven by things that can be driven from the community perspective, and then also they can they can sort of like bubble up to sort of the policy level in some ways. I'm going to shy away from answering those questions. Um, yes, uh, in looking at this model, right? Uh, this model that was based off of the experiences that grew out of uh, the experiences, the oppressions, and the challenges that I experienced and innately understood that if I, as someone that felt like I was fairly competent, was experiencing them, then what hope is there for Akisha? What hope is there for Tolga or Ashara, right? That if I, as a business person, talking about social impact work, as a social entrepreneur, as a farmer, as an agriculturalist, as an environmentalist, if I was experiencing as a pleasant person, typically, right, it's same pleasant person. If I was experiencing these challenges, would make me question my whole entire existence in mental health, right? Um, what hope was there for anybody else? But what I also understood and made sure not to do is I am not a storyteller. And I push back on anybody that considers themselves a storyteller because you can quantify the financial benefit in storytelling, right? But I, I, I realized that it wasn't for me the same as James, right? It wasn't for me to tell the stories of the other women or to take what they, their kitchen table conversations they had, we have um, as a resolution. It's to create space through a cooperative model to give them voice. And obviously they wanted voice because they wouldn't have signed up 900 people strong for a meetup with absolutely barely any programs on it, right? And my fear of, or my concern of how do I support the lives of these women? The model that we're working on as part of our cooperative is to um, advocate right it is to give power place and voice to the women um what can be done in the city of boston i mean basic the cooperative has developed a policy brief that if anybody's interested feel free to contact um, us through our website to share our policy brief uh developed by black women from tufts right um on ways that we can ensure that policy is being used properly right to make sure that uh, our city stays equitable and diverse and um, is a welcoming space for all races and cult cultures, um, all lesbos of socioeconomic uh, communities. Uh, and that's my biggest thing, uh, is where are we with policy? Where are we with our elected officials? Um, where are we with who's being actionable, right, about in policy around understanding the communities, not who's a reflection of the community, but who is putting policy into place to support these communities. And I always ask people to interrogate themselves on how an organization that is poised with over 900 women in the cooperative is not acknowledged in the city. And how does that tie as an African American, how does that tie to the history and the relationship between the city and this African-American community that fought back so vigorously that we were able to create space and demand space, not only for ourselves, but for so many others, and then to be the victim of marginalization in that advocacy. So um, I hope that you will keep an eye on the co-op and some of the policy suggestions that we have, but also in supporting the women and telling their stories and experience so that people who are thought leaders right as i look to transition out of this co-op that the people who are thought leaders can help with those stories in a way that um creates a, a truly sustainable impact i mean sustainable to sustain each family that wants to stay in the city of boston as a generational member and contributor to these cities and neighborhoods and and um yeah that's Beautiful. I, I had to say, I had 
there is this like um, long history of African American and cooperatives in the US that not many people know about. So it's like a, it's, mm. it's amazing to see you sort of like continuing that because I think it's a, it is it is part of. Yeah. I want to be thankful to the cooperative community around the country. Um, I was asked if we would we be safe to say in the documentary that we are the first African American co op in the city of Boston. And I said, Oh, if you show me somebody else that developed the co op historically, I will gladly see that that reputation that brand to somebody else right. Because I always was looking for someone who understand who had a cultural competence and understanding around this work to be able to again provide us autonomy and allow us to dream out our future and be resolution based about that future. Um, but I want to honor Ben Burkett and uh, Myrna and um, Tamala Bladlock, Tamala Bladlock, and so many other people who came from around the country, African American people, Jessica Nemhart Gordon, who came and sat with me and, and educated me that uh, even though I didn't have an understanding of the history of African American co-ops in Boston, that there was a deep legacy of community sustainability stabilizing against violence that went into most cooperatives throughout this country and especially in the deep south. Um, so I'd like to thank those farmers and agriculturals, agriculturalists in the south who have allowed me to uh, better understand and to harness the, the symbiotic relationship between African-Americans, community stabilizing and community cooperation and cooperative development. And the connection to the land, I mean, there is a lot, I mean, I mean, one of, I mean, I, again, this is not about just that, but I think it's yeah. also like, I think it's striking to me that, that you're connecting many components that, that have been, they're deeply, connected to the history of the uh, African American community in the US. Um, I know that we are running out of time. So I, I, I wanted to um, uh, I wanted to ask you um, about the lesson that you have learned from this documentary and reflections that you want to share with with us, uh, with our members uh, from NCRC uh, and um, Especially when it comes down to sort of like organizing social yeah. and, and racial justice, things that you that you want to share with, with us in terms of reflections. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I deeply love, honor, and acknowledge so many women and men who are in this work. Um, my focus is on women. Um, my focus is on a community of African American women inclusion. Um, I guess what I'd like to share with so many people who are involved in policy is that to look around and not see more space created for African-American women and men, but African-American women is to deny the power that we've had in saving this country. To not have to deny an African-American woman, a business person, the ability to live and thrive. And I'm not talking about a municipality. I'm not talking about who advocates for us. Right, I'm talking about African American women in each community in these cities and states who came out and fought back against the legacy of oppression for all of us LGBTQ, immigrant rights, other minority women, lower income class women, lower in, um, lower class women. I want to think about Tosha Brown. I want to think about. Um, so many women, uh, our patron, patron saint Stacey Abrams, who pushed back against gerrymandering, who organized in the simplest ways of door knocking and engagement, that if we, we cannot consistently um, not provide safe space or policies or in, and ensure the implementation of those policies falls down onto the ground where women stand um, to, to honor and acknowledge African-American women who with their votes came out and said that we as a country need to be more equitable, more, more, there needs to be more quality. We need to push back against isms that are oppressive. And so I asked the audience, um, to watch the documentary and the, the microaggressions that are still faced in 2020, 2021 
for communities that are perceived to have little voice and to pick it up and to use it as a, a tool of education and to see what is happening on the ground and to figure out ways to make sure the policies are implemented in a way that the resources are received by women of color, right? And acknowledgement for the work that we do constantly and wanting to a space and a country uh, that recognizes the experiences of all. Thank you, James. Any final reflections that you may have? I, I just want to mention that we, um, Coffee and I, are engaged in a campaign to bring the film to uh, partner organizations around the country. Um, we have a website called a reckoning in Boston .com that where you can learn more about the film. And if you want to be part, if, if you're part of an organization that cares about, you know, for example, affordable housing or racial justice, or economic equity, um, please join with us and bring, bring the film to your organization. Um, and we will have these kinds of conversations all over the country and i mean we put a lot we put like six years of work into this film with very very little funding and we care deeply about the issues in the film and i feel you know we really hope that the film maybe could make a little bit of a difference in the world making the world a bit better so um yeah that that's my pitch well I feel like you make a lot of difference. I don't know why James is shying away from this. This we see the documentary making a lot of difference in how we look at communities as in the background in my living room. I'm watching CNN and um, the George Floyd trial. We need to understand how to better support these communities so that uh, we are not African American communities migrant communities are not subject to the type of violence that causes them their lives, livelihoods, and um, just issues with mental and physical stress and ailments will make a difference. Well, I have to say it is a very powerful film to watch. Um, I think it's, um, Kathy, you did an, an amazing job yeah. through the film and, um, James, I mean, the whole production was amazing. So I really recommend the film to anybody who is going to watch, see this workshop. And we definitely want to sort of like, uh, um, we're going to sort of like propagate for people to sort of see it. Um, I, 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 I do think it can really connect us with, as you say, with social justice, racial justice, and, and economic equity that we all sort of like uh, are fighting for. and. Um, I really want to congratulate you because I think I think um, it takes um, um, it takes a lot of sort of like courage to sort of like put yourself there and go through this and and uh, thinking Kathy yourself and then James making yourself vulnerable and really kind of like uh, connecting your personal life to all these sort of big and deep kind of systemic issues going on here that is affecting all of us. So uh, I want to thank you for being part of this. Thank you. Being in this workshop, and uh, I appreciate the two of you. Thank you. And um, from the in the name of NCRC. Thank you, Anik. Thank NCRC. you, NCRC. Thank you, Juan. James, as usual. Thank you, Coffee, and thank you, Juan. And this let's keep been, in touch. Yeah. This has been great. Thank, thank you. you. Oh.
Hello. Hi, Kathy, hey, James. Hey, Juan. Good see you again. Good to see you again. Um, now we're live. So we have, I think we have a few minutes and um, um, see if we have any questions um, from people attending this workshop. First place. Um, well, again, I'd like to appreciate your participation in this workshop and, and every time that I see the trailer, I see many new things and I've seen the film, the entire film. So, so I think it's a, I truly recommend the film to uh, people attending this workshop. I think it's sort of like, as I, as I said in the pre-recorded session that it brings a lot of complexities. Yeah. Um, yeah, one question is about like, Kathy, if you can provide uh, any update on the cooperative, how is that going? Um, uh, it's going well. Uh, we're still, of course, uh, doing a crowdfunder. Um, I'm still trying to process like why we don't have more resources around capital investment for the co-op. Um, but in that frame of thought, um, one, um, I'd like to thank uh, Coffee King of Compass and uh, Dr. Kim Richards, Chris Hunter of Lease, and Casey Brock Williams of City Boston, and uh, Ben Burkett, Robert Great um, Gates, and um, especially uh, Congresswoman Presley's office, and uh, especially Senator Warren's office, who um, I didn't have a chance to thank before because when I was going through eviction and um, go through some of my more troubling issues, calls to her office are heard. And um, it's unfortunate that the calls are around personal issues rather than community issues, but the responsiveness has always provided me um, a sincere level of hope um, on what our elected yeah. officials are doing. So uh, thank you to Dr. Warren's, I mean, sorry, uh, <laughs> Senator Warren's office. Um, how's the co-op going? So this is our second year growing. We've, um, as far as the co-op itself, I should say, uh, we um, are still organizing. We are working on business plan development. My hope is that with updated business plans and financial outlooks, um, that we'll be able to uh, receive more support around capital investment, um, a problem that we've noticed in this co-op. Um, Leaf was able to, Chris was able to uh, dig into that and Coffee King were able to dig into that of being in this social impact nonprofit um, but for-profit uh, framework. And um, right now, a lot of people haven't exposed themselves as people who could provide us uh, capital startup money to, um, to complete the business planning, complete the structuring, um, and to, so on and so forth, uh, do outreach for the women. But um, I'd like to admit that we've also just completed our first round of a community health program that we put our first round of women through. So the first round of women um, in the co-op, 10 women went through a Tufts program, community health certification. And that community health certification is to deal with um, to respond to the mental health issues that go into doing uh, um, a community outreach and um, real effective work around uh, a, a dealing with trauma and healing. Um, I'm, I'm very thankful to, again, Dr. Ona for working in partnership with us um, and for the women who completed that program. So the co-op's going well. We're thankfully, um, which was always my intention of growing slowly, but effectively towards sustainability and this added piece of bringing community health workers into the co-op, um, again, to deal with mental health and trauma issues um, is all designed, is a, the same design that we worked on five years ago and to see it come into fruition, although late, but to see it come into fruition um, uh, provides me the utmost uh, hope, faith, and humility. Great, it's good to know that. Um, also, um, there is a link of the Erikonin in Boston website so that people can go there and, and, and see the trailer and hopefully like uh, see the film. 
Yeah. And, and, and and James, uh, I've been talking to different individuals about the film, and, and it's kind of causing people curiosity. And I and I and I saw there was an interview or some reporting in I think WBUR, I believe. So it's getting yeah. sort of the word out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we had a New England premiere on over the weekend, and we were on Radio Boston Coffee, Carl and I, mm-hmm. and uh, there were two pieces in the Boston Globe that were both really positive. And there's a recent piece in Arts Fuse. Yeah, we're getting just lots of um, lots of coverage for that. So, and we'll be at the Roxbury International Film Festival at the end of June as well. So that's because we sold out at IFFB fairly quickly. This is another opportunity for people who didn't get a chance to see it at IFFB. Yeah, the, it was a sold out showing, and. Um, the response back from uh, uh, public radio and WBUR um, on covering the subject matters uh, has been amazing. And it's really been amazing for me to talk about not just the work with the documentary and the work with our long-term intentions for this co-op for women involved in agriculture and community development, but it's been amazing to be able to finally talk about and identify myself as a farmer and um, to ask the question of our community here in New England and especially Massachusetts, um, who who are the black farmers in Massachusetts and hopefully solely I'm not the only one, but um, to hopefully see if there's a tribe out there of other black women who are rural enterprise farmers here in Massachusetts, you know, to to come to light um, and for me to be able to find a community. And if not, to begin the very large step of creating one. Have you have you connected with some of those? Uh, how can I call them? Other cafes around, like the Massachusetts yeah. area. <laughs> the other cafes uh, would really just be uh, farmers. So um, I know a lot of this work uh, intersected and engaged with uh, social impact uh, work and social entrepreneur. Um, and I appreciate that question about talking about the many ways that we can look at this work and how it's all interconnected. And this documentary being one of the first documentaries that show the interconnectedness of, um, you know, uh, 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 of community health and public health, especially when we look at African American minority and immigrant women. Um, but no, they haven't identified themselves. I know of like one other maternal, paternal African American farmer out there uh, who um, I believe came from Revision House. But I, I have to believe somewhere in Massachusetts, as far as maternal, paternal experience of the African American growers and intentions around that, there has to be more than two of us. Um, and if there are not, if everybody, anybody knows who is out there and who has the experience around socioeconomic class issues, um, African American experiences around poverty, and uh, can um, bring those experiences to the table around holding space, please uh, reach out to me um, in Massachusetts. I would love to connect it with them. Great. Um, see if there's any questions comments um if not i'm going to keep asking questions that's fine uh, um and 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 i i mean one one thing that i've been thinking after like i like pre-recorded sort of session um are there like community groups in the boston area and other places that are sort of like uh have you been in contact with them and terms of like sparking the interest in seeing the film or like using the film as a, as a tool for reflection, for community kind of like conversations and, and trying to sort of think about how that space also can be a space for the film that that, that can be used. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll speak to my truth and then James can speak to his. Um, I still think that many organizations see this documentary as a grenade or as something that can be highly politicized. Um, we were talking to Suffolk University today and um, I just had to remind them that as everybody, you know, um, talks about the tenacity of um, having that conversation with the city, I have to remind them that we hold no ill will to the Department of Neighborhood Development or Sheila Dillon, that we just understand that it's also a misunderstanding and a miscommunication 
that is specific to a socioeconomic class here in Boston. It just so happens that that socioeconomic class is of the majority rather than the minority. Um, but we were talking about how nobody's even in this political time, nobody's questioned um, who had we talked to about this co-op in the last five years, what city councilors we did talk to um, or who weren't, wasn't responsive to uh, the plights um, and talking about creating safe space for, um, you know, this generational community of African American women and men here in the city who desperately needed uh, the space and the advocacy. Uh, so um, what we would be looking for is not just use it as a tool. What we'd be looking for is in partnership and acknowledgement around still the, the, the majority of deficits that exist in thinking about food systems for African-Americans, um, mental health services for African-American women, and um, you know how we how we re-envision how funding is allocated to organizations and how we continue to in, um, innovate and in problem solving that provides actual real resolutions rather than you know um, continues to 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 build these cathedrals to a solely charitable work. Um, so. Um, no, we haven't had a huge response back out in Boston. We hope to be able to hear from our policymakers and embracing the project or finding out what the needs of the project are um, through policy, through, again, municipal funding. Um, and we hope as we come to um, our, our spin around uh, city of Boston, Massachusetts, um, that we do have more outreach from people who are not afraid of these subject matters and want to resolve them and want to understand again not just the successes of the co-op but want to understand where we where we failed and, and what do we learn in five years that's the big thing um and also to encourage as we think about policy i realized that um and doing a little research around an article um that we were considering writing and, um to remind our community that this has to be policy work and thinking about when there was a revisioning of the Massachusetts food plan a few years ago and how um, in that, that food revisioning of the food plan for the state of Massachusetts, there was no mention of black farmers at all. And I'm um, reading that over and over and over again, trying to see um, in partnership with that organization, um, how they looked at black farmers in a co-op and cooperatives and stabilizing um, food systems for environmental justice, climate change, community development and community health. So um, it, it does, uh, I see it first being around policy work, but I'm hoping that uh, partners identify themselves. I'm sure James can speak to uh, organizations um, maybe that I'm missing that have reached out partnership around the documentary as a tool. James. I think we've had probably around like 20 screenings over the last couple months and they really vary widely in terms of how it how the Q&A goes um, but there's some been some really deeply moving conversations mm -hmm. that I think have really been deep and profound. We've talked to um, colleges and universities, uh, urban planners in Cor at Cornell University, humanities organizations um, and there's there's a lot more in the works in the next uh, few months. So we just wanna keep it going. We've got thing. I think now that we've sort of opened up in Boston and it's been seen fairly yeah. widely here, there's gonna be more opportunities in Boston um, coming up for more screenings here. My hope is that we can uh, start landing these conversations out of just uh, media and academia. Although we do love academia um, as far as uh, using uh, those thought leaders and the perspective of people who, of these subject matters, which are well studied and well researched, um, and how they, uh, again, um, advise uh, policy and policy leaders and politicians. Um, but we have not landed squarely in the space of talking of food systems work. Um, we want to thank uh, the University of Vermont, the humanities course, for bringing us there. But we do hope that um, 
the organizations continue to say that this is not a taboo subject matter and that we're not, uh, in, we don't succumb to individualism in this work, but that this is all part of the process of building a stronger community. And that, um, as I've been saying, that um, nobody in New England can consider themselves um, progressive while silencing the voice of the people who are on the ground who are having these everyday experiences around eviction, around food access, around cooperative development, around self-actualization and mental health and wellness. So and, I've been, sorry, James. Uh, I just wanted to add one that um, our website is a reckoning in Boston, um, Like if you're part of an organization or university that wants to partner with us screening the film, we would welcome that opportunity. Okay. We're actively working on that. It's a reckoning in Boston .com. That's great. And we and we just posted that in the um, in the comment side. Oh, great, great. I think great. I I think we're running out of time. I Can I say one thing? I am so sorry for the Common God Cooperative. I just missed one O. It's a beautiful typo, but it is very egoic. Um, so that was some, um, uh, yeah, um, Thank you. I kept trying to reach over. I, 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 I needed to reach over to see if I could correct it. I, no, I, and I, I, I thought you were saying God, God is a is a common being for everybody. That, I thought no, you were saying yes, that. Yes, it it it, it is spirituality. <laughs> very attached to this word uh, religion, but it's common good cooperative. And we also ask the community that. Um, our crowdfunder that we have on the I Fund Women platform, um, hopefully it can be linked to this project. Um, it's um, the if you're interested in the work and would like to keep up with the work. It, again, we don't own this land. As this weekend, I just came back from Western Mass, uh, Southern Vermont, and uh, Western Northern Connecticut, looking for land and attending a polo match. Um, that you uh, become a member. It's a twenty-five dollar membership, but it um, it keeps you up to date and in solidarity with us and where we're going um, as we expand out to to, to rural spaces. Kathy, if you want to post that in the comment side, uh, I'm gonna have um, because we're running out of time. You want to post the link for that? Sure. Um, and and I, I just wanted to sort of ask you like any final thoughts, words, James. Maybe you can. Uh, for, for closing this, this workshop? Um, I guess I'd say, you know, try to see the film, try to, to um, look for opportunities to see it. We want to partner with you. Um, I think these stories are powerful. They're stories that I didn't know five years ago myself and that they have changed me in, in important ways. And I think that um, they have the, the film has the potential to change other people as well and, and change hearts and, and minds about the lives of uh, people of color in Boston. Yeah. And in an attachment to this work and keeping an eye on us and supporting us um, and not being afraid again, not we don't ask anybody to live in guilt or shame or be tribalistic about this work. We say that this is going to be uh, efforts by like NRCR, I hope N1 and so many other thought leaders out there in this region to see how do we support this. And then as a model, how do we replicate it in city of Boston and how do we use it as a case study for other cooperatives and their sustainability and well-meaningness um, well as we start to look at new ways of providing healthcare to uh, lower resource communities. Thank you. Thank you to two of you. I really appreciate your time with us and your thoughts and, and again see the film and Kathy you know where to find me I'm in Boston so I, I, I'm not gonna run away you might be the so one writing the paper on this. You never you, know. yeah, um, again, thankful to Dr. Fernando Ona and Nicole Morris and again Kathy King and Chris Hunter of Lee okay. very much okay thank All you right. again and have a good night have Thanks. a good night as well enjoy your day